present and future. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Duran. I'm the Senior Vice President of Business Development for Lear Investment Management. And this is our May session of the uh, our, um, uh, strategy update. And we are joined uh, as always by Jim Warner, the co-portfolio uh, manager and head of research. Um, we encourage you, uh, you know, to ask questions uh, throughout the throughout the session. You can do so by um, kind of just touching the screen. There's a Q&A box at the bottom. Please feel free to load that up with questions and we'll address those, you know, at the uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, interesting times. We've got uh, earnings season, got an election year. We've got roller coaster of a year. We've got pullbacks. We've got uh, tech is in, tech is out. Interest rates are high. Um you know, uh, recession possibly looming. I don't know. Hopefully, uh, Jim will address some of these and and or all of these. But uh, without further ado, <clears throat> I'll uh, turn it over to you, Jim. All right. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, as always, I'm going to share my screen so we can go through some of uh, the things that we've learned this past month. Um, so you should be able to see it now. Okay. So, uh, the title of this month's presentation is Higher for How Much Longer? And of course, I'm referring to interest rates. Um, now, one of the things that happened during the last month, as you're probably well aware, is that we snapped the five-month winning streak um, in April, and we had pretty sizable uh, pullbacks. Uh, the S&P 500 pulled back 5%, the NASDAQ pulled back 7%. As we've always said, these pullbacks of this magnitude are very common in any given year, for any given reason, but the reasons that were really provide that really provided the, uh, the the desire for investors to sort of take profits after a nice rally was certainly because of the higher interest rates on the back of uh, a series of hot inflation metrics. And so we will go through those today, and we'll talk about this. Um, and the one thing that I mentioned is uh, uh, that this this was really broad based. So you can see that the S and P was down four, uh, Nasdaq down six. Equal weight down five, uh, Dow Jones down five. So it was a very broad pullback. And if we look at it on a sector basis for the S and P 500, uh, every sector was down ex with the exception of utilities. The interesting thing about utilities is that you know one of our big secular themes that we've been invested in for you know well over a year or two has been the need for larger, more powerful electric grids, and uh, as electricity consumption is going to skyrocket in the future with not just the adoption of electric vehicles, but the increased number of data centers and now AI-based data centers, which consume huge amounts of electricity. So utilities was actually able to buck the trend, which was great and very good for our portfolios because they tended to, they, uh, they outperformed their indices and benchmarks. Um, but as you can see, this was pretty broad based. It didn't matter if it was a cyclical name or a technology name. Uh, investors took the opportunity to take profits. If you did not receive a copy of my uh, newsletter that I published uh, roughly two weeks ago, uh, please reach out to, to Keith or myself, and we're happy to get that to you. Uh, we walked through in much greater detail uh, about the pullback itself, um, and so we're happy to uh, send that out to you. Now, of course, one of the big disappointments for not just this year, but really for the last three years or so, has been bonds in anyone's portfolio. They have been the worst part. Uh, this bond drag is obviously caused by one very simple reason, is that higher than expected inflation means higher interest rates, yields up, bond price down, right? Um, and we've been wrong uh, and early on our call that bonds would be a good place to invest. Um, but so far, um, uh, we've been able to sort of keep our losses at a, at a minimum in our bond portfolios. Um, and we're actually starting to look pretty positive about bonds for the back half of this year. And we'll get into some reasons why uh, this may be changing. Now, one of the reasons um, that we're getting more excited about bonds is that uh, was the announcement uh, by the Fed and Chair Powell's press conference um, just about a week ago. And it would seem that a Fed put has been put in place. And what do I mean by that? Well, there were two very important takeaways from what was otherwise a pretty dull 
uh, you know, event. I mean, obviously the Fed didn't change interest rates, uh, but what they did do is number one, uh, during the question and answer period, Chair Powell uh, stated that it is unlikely that the next policy rate move will be a hike. So that's interesting. So let's just think about that for a second. So if we basically can view today's rates, today's least Fed funds rate as the ceiling, that means there's only, only one way to go, and that's down. And that's actually going to be very positive for bonds. It will also be positive for stocks, um, so long as there's not some sort of extreme event uh, that happens uh, in the macroeconomic conditions. The other thing that the big takeaway from that meeting was that quantitative tightening is now unwinding. So they talked a little about talking about it uh, a couple meetings ago. Now they're actually doing something about it. So they lowered, specifically, they lowered the cap on the treasury redemptions from 60 billion down to 25 billion. Basically what this does is it adds liquidity um, to the market and takes less selling pressure off of the treasury market. Um, and so this is good. This is good for markets. Um, and that's why the market rallied on these comments. Now, the only question is, will inflation, inflation cooperate? So one of the things that's happened during April and uh, was that we got another hot inflation print, specifically CPI, and I'll go into the details of it. Um, but basically, this lowered rate cut expectations throughout the market and ergo led to higher interest rates. You can see in the Fed funds curve down below that the bar on the left is where we were back in the end of uh, March. And the bar on the right uh, is where uh, we were just a couple of days ago uh, when I updated this. So you can see basically that all interest rate expectations um, out the curve and, and the dates um, are reflective of the next Fed meetings. But you can see that all rate expectations got shifted higher to the point where uh, we now have only 25 base point rate hike baked into the curve at this point. Now, remember, we entered this year with six to seven rate cuts on the table and baked into the market. So there's been a pretty material adjustment um, at taking out rate cuts from the interest rate curve. And that's why you've seen this sort of upward pressure across really the entire uh, interest rate environment. So getting to this CPI hotter than expected um, inflation report, um, this we received yet, this is now the third CPI report in a, in a row that came in higher than consensus expectations. Um, and you can see down here that, you know, basically this isn't a really good looking trend. We had 3.1%, 3.2%, now up to 3.5%. It would give you the, it would, it would imply that we have some pretty sticky inflation out there. And that in fact, I believe has really become kind of the new consensus that we're going to have higher for longer rates, that the Fed isn't going to do as much, that we've sort of, you know, kind of um, stalled out, uh, if you will, on, on inflation, on progress on inflation. And in fact, if you dig a little deeper into CPI, into a measure uh, that is now called the super core CPI, um, things actually look even worse. Um, the CPI, the super core CPI is really CPI minus food and energy, which is, you know, we typically take that out anyway, because it, those are very volatile. Shelter, now that's an interesting point, and I'll come back to that, but, you know, our view is that shelter is elevated relative to the reality on the ground. Um, and then lastly, core goods. Now think of just like durable goods, like washing machines and things like that, which have been deflationary. So when you strip all that out, what you're left with is about 24% of CPI, and that includes medical care services, you know, like going to your doctor and, and procedures, transportation services like airline tickets, um, hotels, education and communication services like tuition, recreation services uh, like concert tickets, that sort of thing. All of the prices in these categories um, do and can fluctuate over time, so they're not as sticky as wages. Certainly wages are a component of each of these as well. But you can see that basically you've had this uptick to 4.8%. Uh, and that's something to watch very closely, um, you know, because this could be uh, a bad trend, at least for the 24% of, uh, of CPI. So we're watching it very closely. Another big culprit that's baked into uh, transportation services is surging auto insurance. I'm sure all of you have, you know, had some sticker, you know, shock uh, when you renewed your uh, auto premiums recently. Um, you know, I think in this last report, auto insurance premiums were up 22% year over year, which is phenomenal um, and probably not sustainable either. 
So we're just going to watch this very closely. But on the other hand, if we look at core PCE, which is the Fed's favorite and preferred inflation gauge, again, core meaning uh, they exclude food and energy, but it includes housing and it includes all those other things like core goods and, um, uh, and services. Uh, the inflation data here is much more, uh, much less concerning. In fact, you can see that it's kind of steadied out in these high twos, um, which is, of course, elevated relative to the Fed's target of 2%. But we've also gone through in previous months and really dissected that and showed that really what's, what's happening is that the housing portion is propping up that number. Um, and, you know, we've gone through a lot of data and we'll talk, we can, we can ask some questions about that too, if you want. Um, we can go through some data on what's happening in uh, local real estate markets. But basically, what you're seeing is that the rest of the core PCE, once you, once you subtract out uh, housing prices, is actually running at only about 2.2%, which is really close to the Fed's target. So on the one hand, the CPI data doesn't look, does not look so good. But on the other hand, the core PCE numbers look, look good, like pretty good. Um, so we're just going to have to watch what the market, how the market interprets that. But for now... The market has sort of embraced this idea that inflation is going to be stay elevated and therefore interest rates will stay elevated for some time. Now, what keeps us up at night? We get this question all the time and I showed this, I think a couple months ago, but one of the things that um, I took a look at was over history, the relationship between the Fed funds effective rate. So this is the Fed funds rate that trades you know, every night in the repo market. So it's a real time metric. Um, versus the core PCE uh, inflation number. And so what you can see is that during periods of time when we have a high Fed funds rate relative to the core PCE inflation number, that tends to uh, lead ultimately to recessions and crises. And the unfortunate thing right now is that we're kind of getting into that territory. So, you know, this doesn't, so it raises the question, and this is the question that really burns in us daily and that we have to think about is, is the Fed going to be too late to cut if we have a problem? And we're so, so the real question is, is you know, as inf interest rates sort of flow through the economy, and it takes about 18 months to do that, um, we will then finally see what the economic impact will be of those higher rates. So, so will we see significant economic deterioration? You know, will we see enough to uh, enter a recession? Clearly, um, the Fed would have to cut rates and cut rates pretty dramatically. So far, things look pretty good. And I'm going to get into that. But this is what keeps us up at night is this gap is, is the Fed keeping rates too high and will they for too long? So the other piece of the Fed's mandate that we, should, we couldn't we can't forget about is the labor market, right? They have a mandate of 2% price target but also uh, a, 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 you know, a, a fully employed labor market. So the labor market is obviously still very strong from a historical perspective, but the market applauded um, the April payroll number that came out on Friday, which showed an abrupt deceleration to only 175,000 uh, jobs added. So the, why was the market reaction so positive to bad news? Well, basically it puts less pressure um, for the Fed to raise rates, which they've now told you they're not going to do, um, and more of an excuse to actually um, reduce rates at some point. So a softening of the labor market is actually a good thing for the market until, of course, it gets too soft, and then we're going to have a problem. But we're not there yet. But it is in interesting that, you know, the, the big positive reaction that we had on Friday um, in the market, which is kind of carried through uh, to this week, is largely on the back of this sort of very friendly labor number. So I think what it bears, the question bears on us to, to answer of, of what is happening with the economy. Are we seeing cracks or are we still seeing just a normalization from some of the very wild excesses of the pandemic um, and all of the fiscal stimulus and the low interest rates, et cetera, that we've experienced over the last um, four years? So let's take a look at sort of our two favorite canaries in the coal mine, um, job openings and temporary jobs. So we've talked about this in months past where these two metrics tend to be very good at predicting where the labor market is going. Um, now, what you can see with the jolts, the chart on the left, is that 
after peaking at historical levels, the number of jobs that are out there have actually start, have been consistently in decline and we're getting back to pre-pandemic levels. Now, there's no panic here uh, because remember uh, 2018, 2019, we had a very strong labor market. So, you know, we're going back to kind of strong labor market from, you know, what was excessive uh, tightness in the labor market previous in, in previous years. So this doesn't, you know, drive huge amounts of concern, but we're going to have to watch this to see how that uh, behaves. The chart on the right is a little bit more concerning because you can see the temporary employment um, jobs are actually declining um, and have been declining for quite some time, similar to the job openings, but they're now below the 2019 levels. So this would indicate that um, that jobs are or that businesses are a lot more hesitant to bring on workers, even temporary workers, which are usually, uh, you know, the, they're the easiest to hire and they're the easiest to fire. So that's why this is an important metric to look at. So maybe this is just normalization, but it, it doesn't take too much for this to turn into uh, a lot bigger layoffs. So we're going to watch this closely. Um, the other interesting economic crack, possibly, um, was you know one one data point doesn't make a trend, um, is the ISM services index. And in April, that actually fell below fifty. Now remember, in these um, this index essentially measures business activity, new orders, uh, employment, and supplier deliveries. And basically, a a reading above fifty percent means that the services uh, industry broadly is growing. Below 50% means it's in decline. So this is the first print since December of 2022 that is sub 50. Um, again, it's too early to call it a trend. In January 2023, we, it bounced back up above 50 again. So maybe that happens next month. But the only other time we've seen it below 50, just to put this into some perspective, is back in the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020. So again, this ironically, this is bad economic news, but it's actually good for the market in the short run. Um, clearly, we don't want to see a lot of 40 prints, um, you know, over the course of the next three to six months. I think that would really start to indicate that the economy is um, slowing down. So, but this is sort of a question mark that we're watching. And then I think the third thing that has been maybe a little on the little bit disappointing is er, has um, been earnings season that we're basically about through. Um, Essentially, about 400 of the 500 S&P companies have reported, and they've actually done okay for the quarter. Um, the average beat is about 1%. The average earnings beat, um, the revenue beat was 1%. Average earnings beat was 8.6%. Uh, so, you know, not bad. But if you look at the chart on the right, um, which I pulled from Bloomberg, you can see that there's a this lower right quadrant is that they, oops, they positively surprised, but the stock went down. So why did the stock go down? Well, in most cases, it was because the companies were offering weaker than expected guidance. So in other words, they're looking out through the rest of 2024 and they're coming back to investors with lower estimates than people had hoped for. So maybe maybe business, you know, maybe the businesses out there are seeing something that, um, you know, in, in their supply chains or in their, um, customer patterns that um, is, is raising some incrementally uh, incremental uh, concerns, but we'll just have to wait and see. So again, like not everything is super, super rosy um, and uh, we're just going to have to keep watching, watching that. So when I think about key, what are the key kind of market viewpoints? And I think this is particularly helpful for um, no, not only understanding how we're investing but also if you have clients that come to you and want to know what's going on uh, and what our thoughts are, this is a good page to come to. The market backdrop is, in our opinion, the consensus believes that inflation um, and hence interest rates will remain higher for longer. Now, as we've sort of gone through, at some point, this, this view is wrong, right? Either things weaken in the economy and interest rates fall um, maybe housing prices start to decline and that pushes down the core PCE, which gives the Fed room to cut. But whatever it is, at some point that'll happen. But right now the market doesn't is only pricing in a quarter basis point for uh, basically the December meeting of, of 2024. So that's where we stand there. The economy, you know, think labor market, consumer spending, that still remains strong. 
um, but there are clear signs of deceleration. We've heard um, commentary from a number of companies that the, the lower income consumer is definitely slowing down their spending. Um, and we've all heard, you know, talk about, you know, in certain areas where, um, you know, fast food places have had to raise their prices um, in order to uh, handle the new minimum wage laws in California, right? These are having impacts on consumer spending that are worth watching. But for now, things remain strong. Um, the market pullback that we experienced in April, we did warn about that. We thought one was due. Um, we looked at, you know, how inflation had gotten a little stretched. Um, but it's normal. And we're actually, we love to we love market pullbacks like that, so long as they're not accompanied with really bad economic news, because it offers an opportunity to buy that debt. And remember, we talked uh, about last month how there's, depending on which data points you look at, somewhere between six and nine trillion dollars that is parked in cash or money markets or short end or short end uh, uh, of the curve T bills. Right. In other words, a lot of there's a lot of money just sitting on the sidelines and, you know, they're, they can do so because they can collect, you know, a five percent, five and a quarter percent interest rate. But at some point, they're going to move out the curve. Now, that might be when the Fed actually starts to lower interest rates and they're not getting quite the yield that they expected. Um, it could also just be that um, they want to partake in, you know, the AI boom or they want to partake in some of the other great trends that are happening in the market and earn more than five percent. But it, it to us indicates that there is a lot of cash that can that is available to buy debts, and that's basically what we've been seeing over the course of the last um, you know week or so. Bad economic news is good good for the markets. That's what you should think. Um, and uh, why? Because obviously it means ultimately less inflation, lower interest rates, etc. Um, so you know. Um, so I think we were probably accurate in, in, in thinking that this dip would be bought. We certainly were buyers, and I'll talk about that in a second. Short term, say over the next, you know, over the summer, um, I think it's entirely likely that this equity market continues to resume its rally, but probably with a bit less exuberance. Um, so I would caution anyone to, um, you know, uh, to get too greedy. Um, I think this is, you know, we're going to need to see... Um, you know, more friendly inflation data for sure to, you know, really kind of light a fire under the market. Um, I think right now there's certainly some hesitation that inflation, um, you know, hasn't been tamed. Therefore, interest rates have to uh, stay uh, stay higher for longer. And so we don't have kind of that feeling the, um, we, we don't, you know, that's going to basically temper um, temper sentiment uh, is, is in our in our best guess. Um, Stocks and bonds, we think probably over the next few months should perform well. Um, you know, we are sort of fingers crossed that this could finally be the pivot for bonds to work. Um, you know, and, and this is where I go back to what Chairman Powell said. If if we can take a rate hike off the table, then at worst, in, interest rates stay where they are. Bonds pretty much stay where they are. You know, pr bond prices stabilize and you collect your yield. Um, best case scenario is we start to see interest rates actually drop, bond prices will rise, and you'll actually start making money in your bond portfolio. So we're hoping for that scenario um, for all, all these folks. But, you know, we don't have a trend line right now that suggests that that's happening, but we're, you know, uh, wide-eyed uh, hoping that that starts. Medium term, uh, sort of think as we get into the fall, um, obviously we've got a very big election um, in November. Who knows how that's actually going to go? I'm not going to talk about it on this on, on this uh, presentation, but obviously there's going to be some volatility. There's going to be some noise around it. Um, but where we are turning more of our attention is to uh, the economic headwinds that I suggested earlier. You know, are these really building? And if so, equities in particular could face some headwinds. So we're focusing a lot of our time on picking stocks that have very strong secular themes behind them to help support their earnings growth um, that will hopefully have less sensitivity to the overall direction of the market. So stock picking, I think, is going to be key over the next um, you know, six months or so. The Fed, by the way, is also not going to be much help, as we talked about. So we're expecting limited cuts. Uh, but there's also a lot of value in this market, even though we're you know, kind of near record highs. 
the if you you know if you take a look at the valuation gap between the S and P 500 and the equal weighted S and P, which you know takes out the impact of the the Magnificent Seven's um, higher valuations, which you can see is that we've we're at you know this this goes back you know called 14 years. Um, the S and P 500's valuation has uh, you know basically never been as high relative to the equal weighted s p as it is today which suggests that somewhere in the equal weighted s p there's a lot of value to be found and we certainly um uh you know have actually found lots of value um and have been adding that to portfolios the other thing that i would talk about here is uh what happens if we really do get a lot of uh if we have a recession or it looks like the the uh, economic data is really deteriorating Bonds in this case, and particularly long duration bonds, um, have a lot of convexity, which means sensitivity to interest rates. If we start to see that, interest rates are headed lower, and these bonds will be a very important hedge to portfolios. You know, in, 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 in the case of a recession, obviously, the stock market tends to struggle. Um, but in the case of bonds in particular, very high quality ones that have limited um, credit risk, um, there is a scenario where they actually will perform quite well. They might even perform just like an equity would. Um, so that's actually some uh, some good news, even in the face of um, a potentially bad economic scenario. Just to quickly go into um, how what this means to global vigilance, this is our moderate balanced kind of strategy um, that's most popular with investors. Uh, you know, we've done a number of things. Uh, we, we did some tax loss harvesting, as we've talked about before. We don't just wait till the end of the year. We are continually tax loss harvesting. Um, many accounts, frankly, need it. Um, we also reduced the interest rate sensitivity in the portfolio um, by ex exiting the TLT. We have continued to diversify into international markets by adding India. Um, and then we bought the dip on technology. If you remember back to the first slide, the NASDAQ went down as much as 7% in the pullback in April. Um, some of the names out there went back, have pulled back as much as 20%. And so it was a great opportunity to add to things that we liked. We added NVIDIA, we added Oracle, we added to our existing position in CyberArk, and, um, and we added to uh, Biotech. So great opportunity to kind of nudge up the equity allocation in the portfolio to take advantage of that dip. This is obviously a perfect example of why we're tactical and how we behave um, on market dips. Um, so that was a good ad. And then lastly, uh, just on tilt, because this has become an increasingly popular strategy. This is the, you know, the growthy, more aggressive version of, of uh, our flagship strategy. Um, again, here we did some tax lossing. Uh, we boosted our, um, our, our holdings in, in gold miners. Um, and we added another really interesting name that plays into this whole um, need to build more data centers and build more uh, to manage the, the energy um, that is required as utilities pump out more electricity generation. So um, it's a great theme. It's become a pretty uh, sizable theme in the portfolio. Um, and that equity allocation is obviously higher um, than the moderate. So um, let me uh, stop right there. Keith, and um, let's go to questions. Oh, great stuff. <clears throat> um, yeah, it looks like we do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, both of them kind of are coming from that that theme chart, which is that I've noticed you've added an India ETF to the portfolio. And could you explain this thinking? Yeah, sure. Well, India is the largest, fastest growing economy in the world. Um, and it has been on an absolute tear that you have an, a, a growing middle class. Um, it's kind of like investing in China maybe 15 years ago, um, 20 years ago, but um, uh, with a more acceptable government, of course. So we've been big fans of India. The, um, the other thing that this gives us is just diversification away from the US. So, you know, I spent a lot of the, the presentation obviously talking about um, the US economy and why, you know, there is, um, a growing set of reasons to maybe be more concerned about its direction um, by putting, you know, allocating to foreign markets that are super strong and healthy, like India, you know, that takes away that not only diversifies the portfolio, but it, you know, ultimately takes a lot of the risk 
of the U.S. economy deteriorating completely out. So um, that's great. And um, it's added a lot of, um, you know, sort of non-correlation to the S&P and the, into the portfolios. Great. Um, and then the uh, next one actually has to do with um, the housing. Um, can you uh, can you update us on um, some any additional housing uh, data? Um, you know, from last from last month to this month. Sure. Yeah. So you know, I didn't spend much time on it in this particular presentation, but I have obviously in previous ones and. What we've been really looking for is because core PCE is is elevated due to elevated housing prices. The question is, well, what's going to happen to housing prices, right? And what we what we were what we have hypothesized during the winter is that as we would enter into the spring selling season, there would be more um, active listings in the market than say last year, which and in the year before, which was very very low. And part of the reason was that we thought that there might be some more stress. It might be amongst Airbnb beers that aren't making as much money. It might be um, because utilities are higher or insurance is higher. But that's what we wanted to see is, is what would happen to the supply? And then also what would happen to demand with, you know, still very high mortgage rates and obviously very high housing prices. Would any, you know, are the buyers there that would step in to soak up the supply? Obviously, why do you look at supply and demand to determine where prices are going? So that's the line of thinking. Um, one of the interesting pieces of data that I just pulled from Realtor.com was um, every, I pulled every single zip code in America and looked at active number of listings. What's interesting is that across the country, listings through um, in April are 33% higher than they were last April. Now, nationwide, they're still well below pre-pandemic levels. So, you know, there's still this recovery in inventories. Um, but the other problem is that pending home sales are in decline, which basically means that people can't afford to buy these homes. And so you're starting to see these active listings grow. So in order to sort of whittle down that universe, what I looked for was um, any zip code that has seen over a 100% increase in active listings uh, year over year. So this April versus last April, um, a year ago. And there are 178 zip codes that have um, uh, have had, have seen basically a doubling in active listings. Um, interestingly, 60% of them are in Florida and 12% of them are in Texas. And then the rest of them are kind of scattered around. Um, and th those are going to be the communities where we're going to have to see uh, whether the buyers show up. Um, one community that's been hit particularly hard is Austin, Texas, and you can already see that um, while listings are growing dramatically, pending home sales are declining, and that's a really bad uh, signal for prices. That means prices have to head lower. So there's a lot of other things I could talk about. I'll stop there on the housing thing, but um, you know that's I think a really really important um, piece of uh, economic data to watch, and, and we're looking at it very closely. For somebody who lives in Florida, it's, uh, uh, that's, a, that's an astounding number. But um, actually, we got a couple more. So this is good stuff. Um, how do you think the ongoing massive federal deficit spending and huge issuance of new treasuries affect yeah. interest rates? Yeah, I mean, we've clearly got a deficit problem. And we've got a, um, you know, and there's a huge amount of issuance that has to uh, have to, has to happen over the course of the next year. Something's going to have to, I mean, we can't persist. I mean, if you had an opportunity to listen to, uh, the head of the IMF yesterday, who's at the Milken conference, I mean, she was pretty blunt about saying that the, the United States has to figure out their deficit problem. So there's no question that that's an issue. What's helped digest the supply um, of treasuries and T-bills is the fact that our interest rates are higher than, you know, most any developed country in the world. So, you know, and so we, you know, that is helping attract investors globally to T-bills and U.S. treasuries. And so at least for the short run, you know, it appears that um, that the world is capable of digesting, um, you know, all this issuance. But there's no doubt that this probably can't persist forever. It's going to depend a lot on where our interest rates go. 
Um, but yeah, we need to get our fiscal house in order and hopefully sooner rather than later. But, you know, how does it actually, how has it actually impacted interest rates? It's hard to say directly because uh, particularly when you go out the curve, but we haven't seen like a huge spike. Um, you know, we, we, towards the end of October last year, when people were really concerned about this particular issue, we saw the 10 year hit 5%. Um, since then, we haven't been anywhere close to that. Um, you know, we're at like four and a half now. So it looks like the that we're digest the market's digesting it, but um, you know it's it's definitely a concern and one that we're watching closely. Nice. Um, so this one has to do with a specific uh, security, despite its massive pullback, isn't Nvidia still trading at a ridiculously high PE ratio? Oh, it's not trading at a ridiculously high PE ratio. It's actually. Because earnings have grown so um, so much, the the PE I, I don't know what it is off the top of my head right now. I can check it, um, but basically, it, it's nothing compared to you know the heady days of Amazon, for example. Um, so you know, but that's real. It's supported by real, honest to god earnings. I mean, the, as much as we have looked around, tested it. I mean, AI has been a theme for us for years. Um, you know. This is have to have stuff. Right now, NVIDIA's chips are on allocation. And they're not just to US data centers, it's globally. Like India alone is building something like 800 data centers. And you know, and it's just unbelievable how much growth is, is going on, um, not just in terms of cloud computing, but uh, you, know, you look at the extra strains that AI puts on a data center, it's like phenomenal. So, um, I don't think there's a, you know, it, there is at some point, there'll be a big deceleration in NVIDIA's earnings. I don't think it's tomorrow. I don't think it's next year. Um, it's probably a few years from now. So at this point, like, I think it's, you know, it's a place that a lot of investors want to be. I think it's a, um, it's okay to have a, a, a portion of your portfolio allocated there. Um, we've off, off also really liked other names that are, um, you know, we've, 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 We've called them fringe AI, so they benefit from AI, but they aren't in the you know a chip maker. Um, but you no, know, that's still a pretty red hot um, opportunity. And you know, don't forget that that had a pretty serious pullback that stock, and so we thought it was an in interesting to add it on on that big dip. Good. Uh, looks like one last question is: What are uh, your thoughts um, on the impact of onshoring and trade tariffs on the economy? Yeah. So. Very important question. I, in, so, if it be if it comes to pass that uh, so we've been doing a lot of work on this because obviously this is going to be a real thing if Trump gets elected, um, and it is going to be really bad for certain industries and maybe really good for others. And so we have certainly been factoring that into you know the names that we're we're adding to the portfolio. We don't want to get caught upside down on that particular issue. Um, <laughs> right now, you know, the, the, the problem with, with Trump is that you're not really sure sometimes whether what he's suggesting is just hyperbole or, you know, what specifically is going to get done in terms of tariffs. Are we going to target specific, you know, is it just going to be China or is it going to also be Europe? So um, we really don't have the details right now to do to give you a, a detailed answer. But I can tell you that, like, it's going to be real difficult if you're Volkswagen and he throws an auto tariff on, you know, EU vehicles. So, um, and there's always workarounds to these things. It's a very complicated question right now. We think we have fairly limited exposure um, to uh, to this issue, but you know, this may not be very good for the market too. This is the other thing I'd point out. Like, this may be a bad market event if this happens. So that's you know another reason why we keep hedging our bets with bonds and and, and commodities, by the way. But um, but yeah, it's an important question. It's one that we're thinking about every day. Good, very good. Um, I think that's all I can see. Um, so I think with that, uh, we're about forty minutes in. So I think we'll just take uh, the moment to thank everybody for your time today. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing you again in, uh, in June. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone.